Bach, now there's a composer who knows that gilded tombs do worms unfold. As his parishioners learned already soon into his tenure as music director for the Leipzig churches, he was prepared to see to it that even the most festive liturgical occasions had their relatively grim moments. Consider Zayed Welch eine Liebe hat uns der Vater erzeiget, BWV 64, a Christmas cantata, whose soprano aria gives powerful expression to a cheerless view of the world that is encountered often in the poetry from Bach's vocal music. Its text reads, with my emphasis to highlight the biblical allusions, what the world contains must, like smoke, fade away, but what Jesus gives me and what my soul loves remains securely and eternally. Even the casual listener can readily hear how this aria's elegant courtly dance rhythms serve to represent the world and how its occasional upwardly trailing off violin and vocal lines convey wisps of smoke. But Bach's compositional engagement with the aria's poetry is deeper and much more interesting than this. As background, it's important to know that several verbal conceits are closely based on passages from Martin Luther's translation of the Bible. To begin with, there is 1 John 2, verse 17, the world with its delight fades away, but whoever does the will of God, he remains into eternity. And then there is also Psalm 37, verse 20, like smoke fades away, the enemies of the Lord will fade away. These sentiments from Psalm 37 may correspondingly put one in mind of James 4, verse 4, whoever wants to be the world's friend, he will be God's enemy. Our aria from Cantata 64 opens with the orchestras performing a textbook example of a specific dance's phrase structure, which is made up of a two beat plus two beat call, followed by a four beat answer. This dance is called a gavotte. Here, to provide a basis for comparison, is what a Bach piece that he specifically labeled a gavotte sounds like, the gavotte from his third orchestral suite, BWV 1068. And here, clearly featuring the very same underlying rhythmic scheme, is the main theme in the aria from Cantata 64. The vocal and instrumental lines of the aria fall in with the melody and accompaniment textures of French style gavottes, as opposed to the more complex textures of Italian style gavottes. And the smaller pulses of both of the two beat call melodies yield two short, short, long gestures, such that the short is exactly half the length of the long, which is also a highly conventional gavotte formula, namely ta ta da, ta ta da. A second phrase divides in the same way, and here the melody's surface rhythm, strikingly, is a flurry of running 16th notes all the way through the phrase. Even so, one can hear from the accompaniment that this music proceeds from an underlying ta-ta-da gavotte gesture directly into the section's closing material. What we have as it happens within this gavotte section is a virtuoso violin line of conventional statement, spinning forth, and closing segments that are frequently found in the ensemble refrains of Vivaldian concertos. Group refrains in Baroque concertos are called ritornellos. So in Bach's Cantata 64 aria, the world of the stately French gavotte contains several key elements of the hyperkinetic Italian concerto. The opening two phrases constitute the aria's instrumental ritornello, measures 1 through 8a, for those consulting a score. Intriguingly, both of these phrases subdivide into 2 plus 2 plus 4 beats. That is to say, the beat patterns in this particular phrase structure are in fact a quadruple augmentation of the underlying ta-ta-da rhythm of the conventional gavotte gesture in the aria's very opening melodic snippet. So, in the relative lengths of its internal phrasings, the whole of Bach's ritornello acts as a sort of super gavotte. The way Baroque arias work is that some or all of the segments of an instrumental ritornello are performed before and after sections that feature the singer. The singer's sections are called episodes. 
The first episode, measures 8b through 24a, consists of two super gavotte internal phrasings, followed by a third configuration of double this length. That is to say, the respective lengths of the three large subsections in this episode, 8 plus 8 plus 16 beats, are a quadruple augmentation of the already quadruply augmented ta-ta-da rhythm in the phrasing of the super gavotte. Thus, by means of this still higher level structure, Bach's first episode acts as a sort of mega super gavotte. In the second episode, measures 28b through 42a, however, these broader gavotte levels fall apart. Though this aspect of the aria structure is far from obvious in casual listening, it amounts to the initial nail in the coffin for the aria's eventual wide-ranging fading away of the world. Not only the surface puffs of smoke in the virtuoso violin line and in the vocal line, but also the very framework of the aria's layered gavotte world itself must fade away. On top of all but one of the singer's long note utterances of the word stehen and fest in the aria's extended middle section, measures 50b through 92a, the instruments curiously perform fragments from the aria's ritornello segments in harmonically and melodically distorted versions. The effect of these passages comes close to the surreal. Let's listen to the most striking examples. For context, here is the way the singer and instruments had presented their gavotte world straightforwardly in the main section. And here, by contrast, is how the singer and instruments interact in the middle section of the aria, where the ritornello's opening segments are fragmented and distorted. Bach appears indeed in this middle section to have put a subtle degree of musical enmity between the singer and the instrumentalist. It's only the singer's own long-held chanted notes that will remain securely. Each of the Italian concerto elements that the world of the French gavotte contains will be disfigured or dismembered or both, and their melodic intactness will have faded away by the end of this extended section of the aria. These gavotte and concerto disfigurements and their enmity with the singer's single pitch chanting in the middle section of the aria do, of course, provide marvelous aesthetic variety, but their creative inspiration may have been just as much biblical as musical. The aria's earlier mentioned main source text, 1 John 2, specifies that the world with its delight fades away, and furthermore, Psalm 37 clarifies that the enemies of the world will fade away. So, in conclusion, what might this all mean more generally? In its public exhorting, our excerpt from Cantata 64 calls attention to several key themes in a pre-modern Lutheran viewpoint that was continually pitted against what conservative Lutherans like Bach took to be the undue and indeed dangerous optimism of Enlightenment thinking. By the way, for Bach's private endorsement of the anti-Enlightenment ideas often found in his public vocal works, we can read, for example, his subsequent handwritten annotations entered mostly during the 1740s into the margins of his personal study Bible. Bach's aria forcefully proclaims that one, the present world is fundamentally not good, it must fade away. Two, humanism and its attainments ultimately add up to nothing. They, can, they cannot fundamentally or reliably make the world better. Only what Jesus gives will remain. And three, only eternity, not problematic time, is cast iron. The temporal world with its ephemeral delights, just like the enemies of the Lord, will fade away. Bach's aria setting went well beyond any call of duty in underscoring these conservative Lutheran sentiments, 
and what even more generally speaking marks his achievement as pre-modern is the fact that his brilliant artistry gave expression not to rationally or emotionally discovered personal truths, but to what were believed to be biblically revealed communal truths. Thank you for your time and attention. After this extended talking, I hope you will enjoy all the more this magnificent video performance of the aria by Maria Kohana, soprano, and Frederick Fromm, violin, with Concerto Copenhagen, directed by Lars Ulrich Mortensen.